I feel like the food that we're surrounded by here is really not actual food, but food like garbage that's massively diluted with refined carbs and fats. So everything we eat is this processed food trifecta of sugar, flour, and oil. And these pure energies, these refined energy, quote unquote, foods, dilute out the protein and minerals, the actual nutrients that we need to eat. So most of us are, are basically forced to overeat energy just in order to get enough nutrients to survive. Body, mind, empowerment. Get stronger, faster, smarter, quicker, friendlier, more helpful, more driven. Everything the body needs. Control your mind. Welcome to the Body Mind Empowerment Podcast. I'm your host, C. Milan, and our guest today is Dr. Ted Neyman. Dr. Ted is a board certified family medicine physician in the Department of Primary Care at a leading major medical center in Seattle. His personal research and medical practice are focused on the practical implementation of diet and exercise for health optimization. Dr. Ted, welcome to the show. Seem, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's, been, it's actually been quite a long time that we tried to do a podcast, but now, now I'm glad that we could uh, eventually do it after a while. Oh, yeah, me too. I, I know you've been trying to have me on and I've just been a real flake about it. So I, I apologize, but it's great to be here. Yeah, yeah, me too. So uh, can you tell us a bit about your background as a doctor and uh, like what your experience been? Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. So um, I've actually been practicing as a primary care doctor for about 20 years, which is, uh, oh, wow, it doesn't feel that long. But yeah, I got out of residency in 2000 and I've been doing this primary care job for about two decades. And uh, it's, it's really been a fascinating journey for me. And uh, my entire career, I've really been focused on diet and exercise and how they seem to impact health. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest revelations for me is the fact that the, the difference between some of the healthiest people I see and the unhealthiest people I see really just comes down to diet and exercise. So these things are, are huge. And that's really been my focus for most of my career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so true that uh, most doctors tend to learn only how to prescribe pills or uh, medication. But, uh, you know, the true health or the most, most effective results come from just the basics. Yeah, I, I mean, honestly, I think when I started out in medicine, I didn't realize how pharmaceutically aligned the entire field of medicine is. And these days, it feels like medicine is just a tentacle of the pharmaceutical industry. And really, uh, so much of our training is just focused around you know, which drug to use for what. And it's uh, a lot of the lifestyle part is just an afterthought. And uh, it really should be the other way around, in my opinion. So that's, that's what I've been focused on. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. So uh, why do you think, you know, what's the main reasons why the States has this sort of like an obesity epidemic? Oh, why do we have such a bad obesity epidemic? <laughs> well, it's really about our, our food environment. So I, I feel like the food that we're surrounded by here is really not actual food, but food like garbage that's massively diluted with refined carbs and fats. So everything we eat is this processed food trifecta of sugar, flour, and oil. And these pure energies, these refined energy, quote unquote, foods dilute out the protein and minerals, the actual nutrients that we need to eat. So most of us are, are basically forced to overeat energy just in order to get enough nutrients to survive. And I think this protein dilution is one of the huge drivers of the obesity epidemic. And it really just comes down to the food that's all around us. Mm. Yeah, that's true. So that, that's what I've seen uh, a lot on your social media and like the infographics you share and uh, the, the uh, blog post that you write about as well, that, you know, the fundamentals of a healthy diet has to do with, you know, maximizing some aspects of nutrient density and protein, especially is like a really critical component of that because like uh, I would, you know, I think you would agree that protein is probably the most important macronutrient 
and it's probably the most essential one as well compared to something else like fats or carbohydrates. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, that's really the focus of, of my book is the importance of protein. And the reality is that your body can convert protein into carbs or fats if it, if it needs to, but you can't go the other way around. You can't turn carbs and fats into protein. So there's this, there's this huge satiety piece to protein. There's this huge um, requirement for protein and protein is really in a league by itself when it comes to the macronutrients. And that's, that's, that's been a, a big focus of mine. I, I've realized uh, over the past few years that if, if you can really just get the protein percentage of someone's diet high enough, uh, the obesity and insulin resistance just sort of fades into the background. And it really comes down to just choosing foods that are higher in protein percentage. And that's really been the, the major thrust of my book is food choice and choosing foods that have a higher protein percentage. Mm -hmm. So uh, you call it like the protein to energy ratio, if I'm not mistaken. Right, right. Right. So uh, can you maybe describe it a little bit or how does it look like? Sure, absolutely. Okay, so the reality is if you look at worldwide hunter-gatherer macronutrient estimations, the, the hunter-gatherers are eating about a 33% protein diet by calories. So they're eating these foods that are extremely high in protein, and you get that high protein percentage by pretty much just eating an animal in its entirety or eating a plant in its entirety. If you just go outside and kill an animal and eat the whole thing, you're going to be getting about two grams of protein for every one gram of fat or non-protein energy. And you have this automatically very high protein diet. And it's basically impossible to overeat these foods. This is why pretty much no animal on earth eating what it's supposed to eat is going to have to deal with obesity, even if it has unlimited supply of the food that it eats. And humans are the same way. If you look at hunter-gatherers, they seem to be free of these diseases of Western civilization, of obesity and insulin resistance and all of the spectrum of chronic diseases driven by insulin resistance. The, the difference is that in the modern diet, the standard American diet is about 12.5% protein by percent of calories. And so these hunter-gatherers are eating, you know, nearly three times the protein percentage that we are. And the difference is that we are massively driven to overeat with a protein percentage this low. There, for two reasons. First of all, we have to eat more just to get enough protein and minerals to survive. And secondly, we want to eat more because this combination of high energy density carbs and fats together is a combination that's not found in nature and really drives hyperphagia and overeating. So it's, it, they're both downstream of protein dilution with carbs and fats, the needing to eat more and the wanting to eat more. The, um, you know, we have a lot of research that shows that the higher the protein percentage of your diet, the less energy you're going to eat in almost a linear fashion. And that's why for me, it really just comes down to surrounding yourself with foods that have a higher protein to energy ratio. Uh, you know, for example, if I rounded up a bunch of people with obesity and insulin resistance, and I just put them on a desert island with uh, unlimited supply of, let's say, beef and eggs and fish, uh, you're, you're going to automatically see all of these people cruise right down to their ideal body weight and stay there because you're just not going to be able to overeat these foods. It, it, the problem is it's solved automatically. So it really comes down to food choice and it comes down to foods with a higher protein percentage and a higher nutrient density, mostly talking about protein and minerals. Right, right. Yeah, those are really, uh, you know, good points that you made there so like uh in the in the western world or the modern world there is a common tendency that the there's an abundance of calories but the nutrient quality of those calories isn't that high and especially like the amount of protein in most people's diets is also very low and that kind of reflects in their body composition as well so to a certain extent because like you said we tend to eat 
until we we get enough of the protein and the other essential nutrients. So the problem is that people tend to <laughs> overeat until they get or until they reach the threshold. And it's actually much more important or much more efficient to focus on um, getting uh, sufficiently or get enough of the protein and the nutrients from fewer calories, so to say, because that would be just healthier for your body composition and uh, general health. Because e even in the hunter-gatherer populations, uh, they're not actually consuming like a whole lot of calories. Like uh, if some, I remember some studies where, you know, uh, scientists would go to the, these uh, tribes to look at how many calories do they burn because, you know, given that they're, you know, they're, they're lean and they hypothetically, they would be just, you know, burning that energy off all the time. But the truth is that they're not really actually eating that many calories. They're eating around, you know, 2,000 to 2,500 calories. And the reason they're able to pull it off is because they're getting like this really high protein to energy ratio diet. Right, right. Yeah, no, absolutely. Exactly. And that's, that's one of the big problems I have with calories in general is that uh, if you, tr I mean, I do believe in calories, of course, they're absolute, but if you tell someone to eat less calories and they're surrounded by this food like garbage that has an extremely low protein percentage, and you just try to make yourself eat less of it, you're going to be starving all the time. And that's, uh, that's why I don't really find the whole calorie concept to be that useful. I think it might be useful to look at non-protein calories, uh, which is really what my book is focusing on. But calories itself uh, really gets thrown out the window unless you're specifically looking at protein percentage. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So. Uh what would be like a good amount of protein people uh, should eat per day? Well, I, I talk to my, my patients about this and I really like one gram per pound of ideal or desired body weight uh, as sort of a, a target to hit. And exceeding that doesn't seem to be a problem, but sort of a minimum of a gram per pound of desired body weight or ideal body weight or reference body weight, what you should weigh for your height, you know? So for example, I'm 5'10 and I should weigh 160 pounds. And so 160 grams of protein a day might be a good target for me. Although to be honest, I'm typically exceeding that and eating closer to about 200 grams. But I like the one gram per pound or even higher, maybe 1.25 gram per pound for someone who's active and uh, doing resistance exercise. And I think that's a really good starting point for pretty much everyone. Yeah. Yeah. So true. And it's uh, kind of funny to compare it to the uh, RDAs of protein, which are like, uh, I think the RDAs are somewhere around that you, you should get only like 12 or 14 or 15% of your calories and protein, which would end up just like for the average person being around like, 40, 50 or 40 grams or 60, 70 grams of protein, which is, you know, the bare minimum you would need to just survive and not, not, not fade away. But yeah, like, like, like I mentioned earlier, higher protein diets tend to be in, in almost all, all cases be better for, uh, you know, just lean body mass, uh, fat loss, just satiety and uh, like the health outcomes as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, the RDA is, uh, you know, it's really meant to just be an absolute bare minimum for to keep you alive. And what I think a lot of people don't realize is as you go higher and higher and higher in protein percentage, you're just going to get better and better outcomes in terms of body composition and metabolism in, you know, omnivore animal models. If you crank the protein up to 50% of the calories, you just get better and better body composition and improvements in insulin sensitivity and metabolism. And there are just these huge satiety benefits to going higher in protein. And there does not seem to be a, a downside to that. Mm -hmm. So I, you almost can't eat quote unquote too much protein but on the flip side, if you're not eating enough protein, you're going to really struggle with satiety and you're going to be overeating energy for sure. And uh, yeah, that's why it's just such a, a big focus for me. Right. Uh, yeah, I think I've seen some like meta analysis where the upper threshold for protein 
uh, when it comes to muscle hypertrophy or yeah, muscle protein synthesis and uh, hypertrophy seems to be around like 0 0.8 grams per pound of lean body mass. And like, yeah, like anything above 1.0 grams isn't like significantly better or it doesn't like show any difference. Uh, so like after that point, you're just essentially using uh, protein as a, like a fuel source instead of, uh, you know, as a tissue builder. So uh, what w is there like any, you know, you said that, you know, if you eat 50% of our calories and protein, like uh, w what would be the reason to include like uh, the other macronutrients then? So if, if you all, if you, what, what will happen if you eat just nothing but protein? Well, that's a very interesting question. And in fact, I don't think we've really answered the question, what will happen to a, a animal if it tries to consume 100% protein? The theory is that it's so difficult to convert protein into energy that you might actually continue to lose weight and possibly even um, suffer from energy starvation, basically, right. if you try to eat 100% protein. And I, I don't think we have any studies that really look at that for any length of time. Um, so I, I don't know that anyone knows the answer to what would happen if you tried to consume 100% protein. Right. That is certainly a really interesting thought experiment. Hmm. Uh, what about, you know, these uh, stories about rabbit starvation and that these hunters that were eating only like lean rabbits and lean meat and they were just essentially like being very malnourished from just you know getting you know this very lean meat that is primarily protein and not getting enough fats and the carbs right and and, and part of that uh the, the stories of rabbit starvation make me wonder if you really would die eventually of energy starvation if you tried to consume nothing but protein you'd obviously uh have trouble if you didn't eat enough essential fatty acids. So I don't think anyone would really recommend that, right. <laughs> a pure protein diet. But it would be interesting to know what happens at those extremes. Uh, I don't think the, those studies are terribly ethical just because uh, uh, obviously you have to eat some fat or you're gonna really have problems. In fact, I don't like people to go below about 30% of their calories from fat because I do think that you're going to deal with um, hormonal issues and uh, suboptimal functioning. But I, I am curious just from a scientific standpoint to know exactly what happens to an animal that consumes 100% protein. I've never really seen a study like that. Yeah, but what about, uh, you know, what's the mechanism uh, by which uh, protein can be used as a fuel source? Like uh, some people say that, yeah, it's converting protein into sugar and carbs. So uh, how does that work? Is, the, is, the, is this process uh, harmful or is it, you know, somewhat benign? Well, you have to uh, uh, deaminate the um, protein and remove the nitrogen. And then you can just oxidize the carbon skeletons in your mitochondria in the Krebs cycle, pretty much the way you would uh, oxidize any other um, macronutrient. So they, you can burn protein directly, and theoretically, some people might have trouble dealing with the ammonia load of that much nitrogen. Um, <clears throat> so there are people who probably uh, would deal with ammonia toxicities if they tried to eat enough protein to get all of their energy from protein, because it really is uh, difficult, if not impossible. Um, but yeah... If you eat more protein than you need structurally, you just deaminate it and oxidize the carbon skeletons in your mitochondria, and it's kind of no big deal. I think the, the real magic of the protein is just the satiety piece. You know what I mean? You just literally can't overeat it. And we just see um, humans and animals eating less and less energy the higher and higher the protein percentage of the diet goes. So I, I know that you're going to max out on hypertrophy over a certain amount of protein. And I know that you're going to just be directly oxidizing protein for energy above a certain intake. But there's still this satiety piece that nobody can really quantify that seems to be extraordinarily beneficial for keeping people from overeating. And I think that's the real benefit of these extremely high 
protein diets is is the satiety yeah yeah i totally agree and uh pro it's very you know difficult to overeat protein because you're gonna get quite sick of it eventually and it's, it's pretty filling uh but uh what about some other macronutrients? Because, I, I, you know, even though like some people, you know, there are some, some diets like the protein sparing modified fast where you're eating like nothing but protein for a short period of time in order to uh, create a huge calorie deficit and like mimic some aspects of fasting and like drop some weight. But uh, those people, they can't really sustain it for too long because it's, you know, they, uh, they, they still feel hungry, etc. Although they're eating a substantial amount of protein. So uh, what would be like some, uh, you know, is it just the protein that is giving the satiety or do you also need like, you know, some uh, fats and other macronutrients because you could, you could only like drink some protein shakes as well, but that's not necessarily going to lead to like full satiety. Right, right. I don't think anyone can do these uh, extremely low energy, high protein diets for any length of time. And I, I kind of don't like the crash diet, protein sparing, modified fast mm. approach. In the book, uh, what, what I'm suggesting people do with the protein to energy ratio of their diet is just increase it slightly so that you are losing weight in a sustainable fashion. You know what I mean? You take the, the protein to energy ratio of the foods that you have habitually been eating and you try to make some food substitution. So now you're slightly higher than before. And as long as you're losing weight on this, then the goal is to make it sustainable and make it long term and lose weight gradually and then end up at just a lower body fat set point that you can maintain long term. If you're not losing weight, you just crank the protein to energy ratio up a little bit more. I, I'm, I really don't want everybody wants to take everything to the extreme. You know what I mean? Right. We're, we're all about the extreme. So the minute someone starts looking at protein energy ratio, they're thinking immediately, what if I just eat egg whites and whey powder and that's it. And, and that's, that's kind of not the goal. The goal is to just take your overall diet vector and slightly increase the protein to energy ratio to a point that you're losing weight in a sustainable fashion, something you can maintain, something that you can keep doing. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, we, we, we always take everything to the extreme. That's kind of the way that's just right. human nature. You know, it's like if, you know, if carbs are bad, then fat is good. And then more okay. fat is more better. And then we just, it, next thing you know, you eat nothing but lard. And right. so we, we like to, <laughs> um, take everything to the extreme, but the goal is to just look at your overall diet crank the protein energy ratio up a little bit in a way that's sustainable and, uh, and then reevaluate and kind of keep going. But, um, but I see what you're saying. It's like, you know, you can't just eat hundred percent protein for any length of time. Nobody can right. do that and nobody would want to. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. <laughs> and it's going to be pretty, uh, catabolic actually, like because you lack the actual energy substrate, that you get from carbs or that you get, you get, that you get from fats. Right. Uh, so uh, what about the other macronutrients then, like fats and carbs? Like uh, where, where do they fit in, in your opinion? Right, right. Well, okay. So carbohydrate is completely non-essential and there's no really uh, requirement for carbohydrate in the human diet. But fat is definitely essential. There are fat, essential fatty acids that you absolutely have to consume. So I don't like anyone to lower fat below about 30% of their calories. And uh, I, I find that as long as you're eating whole foods, you know, whole animal foods like meat and fish and eggs, you kind of get a perfect macronutrient balance. And I think that's what I want most of my patients to emulate. You're, the goal is to eat whole food fats. So you eat an animal in its entirety and you get this perfect macronutrient balance of protein to fat. And I really think that's kind of the sweet spot. And that's, that's my advice to most of my patients. It's like anytime you're eating an entire animal, your macros are probably perfect. If you mm. just eat ground beef, you know, it's just a whole cow. That's perfect macros. Or uh, yeah. uh, you eat an entire uh, 
a turkey or a fish or seafood or eggs or that sort of thing, you, you automatically get this perfect macronutrient blend. And that's really what I want people to do, tar- target, you know? Mm. Yeah, I, 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 I think I agree with you that like uh, the whole foods that you see in nature, especially the protein foods like meats and uh, fish and those sorts of things, they tend to be pretty uh, optimal in terms of the macronutrient ratios for like a baseline diet for someone who like just wants to be healthy and uh, you know sustain their body composition etc so yeah like carbs are definitely not essential and your body can very survive very well without them for a very long time and uh, and just just be in this very ketogenic state and keto adapted and although you may be eating slightly more protein uh, which will may inhibit ketosis in some aspects. It's not like that you're uh, missing out on a lot of the benefits of the keto adaptation, and you're still able to burn uh, fat quite efficiently. Yeah, exactly. And, and and then my advice with the eating frequency is to try to shrink that down a little, so you're getting this sort of pulsatile um, eating, and you're spending more time perhaps in fasted state with a deeper ketosis. And then it's fasting and feasting, you know, mm-hmm. so you have the kind of different phases where you're exposed to more um, ketosis and fasting versus the fed state. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, w- would you still eat some carbs every once in a while or uh, are you completely anti-carb? Well, actually, no, I'm not completely anti-carb at all. And in fact, in the book, I'm recommending that what people should do is decrease their carbohydrate frequency somehow. So right now in this country, the average American is eating eight times a day, every two hours for a 16-hour eating window. And they're eating a total of about 300 grams of carbs. So you're literally eating carbs every two hours of your entire waking day. And the the downstream problem from that is that people are so glucose dependent and they just lack this fat adaptation. And as your liver glycogen is falling over and over again, after your last meal or snack, you just get hungry again for more glucose and more carbohydrates. And for me, the real secret is shrinking down your carbohydrate frequency. Mm -hmm. Even if you ate the same amount of carbs, but just did that once a day, you would automatically reap the benefits of flipping the metabolic switch. You know, 12 hours later, you're going to enter ketosis and you're going to be more fat adapted and you're going to be uh, upregulating your ability to run your entire metabolism off of stored body fat. And all of this magical stuff will happen if you just um, shrink your carbohydrate frequency and, you know, instead of, uh, eating them a little bit all day long if you maybe just ate once a day. So in our book, we're, we're recommending that people shrink their carbohydrate frequency. You know, maybe you, you do eat carbs and maybe you just eat them once a day. And, and I prefer uh, eating carbs in the evening because this liver glycogen seems to give people a little bit of a parasympathetic nervous Uh, system dominance, which is more of your rest and digest mode versus the sympathetic nervous system dominance of the fasted state where you have no glycogen, you're more awake and alert. And so my, my favorite pattern is, you know, very low carb or no carb during the day, and then maybe one carbohydrate event in the evening, you know, especially some sort of uh, fruit or tubers or some sort of a uh, carbohydrate source that's going to have a, a low energy density and a high nutrient density. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, that's, that's pretty awesome that uh, this, this sort of, uh, you know, car backloading or in a sense is very, actually very efficient for maintaining uh, the keto adaptation to a certain extent, as well as uh, reaping the benefits of ketosis during the day. Because yeah, if you're eating carbs all the time, then you're never actually going into ketosis and you're just, you know, making yourself more tired during daytime as well and uh, being constantly dependent of glucose and eating, eating frequency. So uh, with, with the uh, strategy of eating low carb during the day, you're able to just keep yourself in ketosis uh, for longer, at least for, for, for the time being. Right, right, exactly. And, and I'm, 
I'm really not anti-carb. In fact, after working with enough uh, real people in the real world, uh, what I've found is that at the very end of the day, people who've eaten no carbs all day long just have this really sort of glycogen hunger. They're really, really looking for maybe just, you know, 100 grams of carbs. And in, if they never, ever, ever eat these, they're resorting to something that's high in fat. Maybe they're eating nuts or high fat dairy or something. Mm -hmm. And they, in my opinion, end up having to massively overeat fat calories just to uh, get this little piece of satiety that they're looking for that they could get with a lot fewer calories, uh, energy calories, if they ate a little bit of carbohydrates. So, so one of my favorite patterns is this, this carb night or carb backloading kind of idea where you just don't eat carbohydrates all day and then you eat a, maybe 100 grams of carbs in the evening. And this really seems to be s sort of a sweet spot for a lot of people. I have a lot of people um, doing really well using this pattern. So I, I kind of like that. It's, it's, it's not completely anti-carb. It's, it's using carbs strategically and yeah. mm -hmm. just working on the carb frequency. Yeah, it's a uh, carb restrictive. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I totally agree. Like most people don't need to do full keto, and uh, they probably don't want to do it either. <laughs> so, like uh, carbs, although uh, they have carbs, they're still satiating, and uh, like tubers and those sort of things, they have fiber. And uh, you you mentioned the glycogen hunger. All those factors are actually very also like very important when it comes to like full on satiety and uh, generally making yourself eat less subconsciously. Right, exactly. And I'm, you know, I'm all about making it sustainable. So I don't think it's sustainable for the average person to never eat carbohydrate. And I don't think it's sustainable for the average person to be on a pure carnivore diet. Mm. And so I'm, so now the question is, how can you still eat some of these foods but you know, reap the benefits of fat adaptation and going into ketosis in a cyclical nature and having a high protein percentage uh, all the way around. And, uh, and for me, it really looks more like a carbohydrate frequency decrease. Um, and this sort of carb night thing is just really, really effective. I'm really, um, uh, that's that's definitely my my biggest recommendation to most of my patients is to try to work on eliminating carbohydrates earlier in the day and then um, backloading those carbs. Right. Uh, what about fats then? Like uh, the the keto diet uh, is pretty high in fat, but it, it can be like modified to a certain extent that you can do like a very low protein diet keto, or you can do a low pr or like a moderate protein keto and high protein keto. So uh, what's your stance on like fat calories? Right. Well, so I, you know, I'm a big keto fan, but unfortunately, I'm not a big fan of refined, processed, added fats. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of patients who are, you know, drinking butter and heavy cream, and they've got um, tons of almond flour cookies and nuts and high fat dairy and cream cheese and sour cream, and and they're eating all of these processed, refined, high-fat foods that are lower in protein. And sure, there's no carbohydrates there, but they just don't seem to get the satiety that they would from something that's not a refined and processed, high-fat food. So I really like whole food fats. I really like you know steak and eggs. I'm not a big fan of refined dairy fat and oil and... Um, those sorts of keto foods because I've literally watched people gain weight and gain fat on a extremely low carb ketogenic diet. I mean, if the, the, it comes, once the carbs are out of the picture, it really comes down to just basic fat balance and it's a war of grams every day. If the number of grams of fat you eat every day is higher than the grams of fat you burn every day, you're literally going to gain weight, even eating no carbohydrates at all. Yeah. And it's just, um, the reality is you really have to worry about your fat balance. A lot of people are stalled out on keto. Half the keto universe loses 20 pounds right off the bat. And then everyone stalls out hard, way fatter than they want to be, mostly from nuts and dairy and oils and refined fats. Yeah. 
So I, everyone who's getting the very, very highest levels of success in my practice are combining some elements of low carb and low fat at the same time. Right. And when you do that, you're mostly eating protein. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, uh, the misconception about keto is that you can gain or you can lose weight eating like copious amounts of fat and you don't have to count calories, etc. But the truth is that calories still matter. And part of the reason why people lose weight on a keto diet initially is that because of the satiety aspect that they start to subconsciously eat less food and they may skip a few meals, etc. But uh, if they keep on doing it or if they hit the plateau, then the most biggest common reason for that is just eating too much fat and uh, adding these, um, you know, re refined calories into their diet, which don't really satiate them that much and uh, making them like overeat. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of keto people don't realize that almost all of the stored fat on people's bodies come directly from dietary fat. When you eat fat, it's immediately stored in your adipocytes where it may or may not be burned later. And what carb restriction is doing is just preventing the displacement of fat oxidation from having to oxidize glucose. So you're just kind of getting that fat oxidation displacement out of the way by limiting carbs, but you're still dealing with the really harsh reality of fat balance. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's something nobody wants to talk about in keto because everyone wants to just eat fat to satiety and not have to worry about it. <laughs> right. But I, I, once the carbs are out of the picture, if you're plateaued, you have to start worrying about the protein to energy ratio of your diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, so you would recommend getting the fat from uh, like uh, whole food sources like steak and eggs and that sort of stuff. Right, right. I think that's the sweet spot. I think that if you're trying to eat, you know, extremely low fat foods like your egg whites and your whey protein, that's not sustainable. You won't get the essential fats you need. Um, that's not going to work. But at the same time, if you're eating these high fat refined foods or your nuts and dairy, um, you're just not going to get enough protein and you're going to have to overeat energy calories. And the, the sweet spot for me is definitely eating entire animals. You know what I mean? Like eggs and steak are perfect. This is why I'm, I'm kind of famous for saying my favorite foods are steak and eggs. And I really think that's kind of the sweet spot, which ends up being about equal grams of protein and fat. And that's about 70% fat by calories. And so, yeah, like, uh, that's, that's a good point, but, uh, you can, I, I would imagine that you can still gain weight by eating steak and eggs. <laughs> like if you eat uh, too many calories, but the thing is, it's somewhat harder to do it, but it's, you know, physically it's still possible. Yeah. I mean, I think it is still physically possible that almost, almost no one is going to overeat these foods. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, what, what about the differences between uh, plant proteins and uh, animal proteins? Well, I think that you can have success on either side. And uh, the reality is that plants store their energy, their carbon-carbon energy, as mostly carbohydrate. And animal stores store their excess energy mostly as fat. And so you end up having an animal diet being more of a high fat, low carb diet. You have a plant diet ending up as more of a low fat, high carb diet. But I kind of like to look at them as two sides of the same coin, you know, because they're both, um, both plant foods and animal foods have a protein to energy ratio that's not dissimilar. So, you know, like green vegetables have a protein to energy ratio that's pretty much identical to that of meat. And you can have success with either side as long as you're focusing on whole foods and looking at a protein to energy ratio. The, where we really get into trouble with plant foods is when we just strip out all the energy and that's your sugar, flour, and oil. Mm -hmm. But anyone eating a whole foods diet Plants versus animals to me is a really kind of a false dichotomy because the protein to energy ratio on both sides is great as long as you're eating whole foods and you're not just trying to get the highest energy part of a plant. 
Right, right, yeah. Because uh, the the body does does like a really good job in adapting uh, to different, you know, food sources in a sense that it can still survive eating uh, a fully carnivorous diet or a fully plant based diet. Right, right. It's uh, yeah, the adaptability of humans is amazing. Uh, I love it, but at the same time, it's led to a lot of confusion because now nobody knows what the heck they're supposed to eat. And you have all these people who just say we should only eat plants versus just animals. And it's, you know, right. nobody really knows. Right, right. Yeah, I think that the main like the main health outcomes of any of these diets, whether that be like a keto, vegan or carnivore diet comes from just like the optimization of the body composition and the, the improvement in biomarkers that ensues, so to say, you can be as healthy on any of these diets, as long as you're at a healthy and lean body composition, you have, you don't have like a bunch of extra fat and uh, your other biomarkers are also fine. So you can achieve that on any diet. Uh, the the difference is that, or, and you can be as sick on those diets as well if you're not losing weight or if you're not, you know, improving your biomarkers, so to say. So it's a very, the magic happens because of like losing some of the the fat and improving your body composition. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Any anything that makes you thinner is going to improve your metabolic health for sure. Absolutely. Right. Uh, but uh, you know, the diff the biggest difference I can think of between animals and plants is that plants have fiber. So, uh, and fiber is also like pretty satiating or it's, you know, filling. So what's your thoughts on fiber? Right. So the, the whole protein energy concept basically uh, recommends eating as much protein and fiber as possible. Hmm. And, and in fact, my, my basic heuristic for anyone who's trying to lose weight is eat foods with either the highest protein or the highest fiber you can. So you're looking at animal foods that are very high in protein, like lean meat, and you're looking at plant foods that are very high in protein, like green vegetables. And so protein and fiber are basically great for satiety. And it's the pure refined energies, carbs and fats that you really have to look out for. Right, right. And especially if you like uh, combine them together, carbs and fats together. <laughs> especially if you combine them together. Yes, absolutely. That just seems to really drive overeating like crazy. Yeah. W why is that? Well, I don't really know. I, I think that the combination of carbs and fats together uh, rarely occurs in nature. Uh, the only occasions in nature where we see carbs and fats together in a food would be mammalian milk and then certain nuts like acorns. These, these foods uh, are, are the few foods that we see carbs and fats in a high energy density together. And what we know is that they tend to drive weight gain and fat gain really rapidly. Like mammalian milk is designed to convert a small baby mammal into a giant mammal as fast as possible. So it, it literally drives overeating. And then these uh, foods that we see in the late summer and in the fall, like nuts, are are designed to fatten omnivores up as, as much as possible so they can survive the winter time. And what I think this, I think what the combination of carbs and fats together and high energy density represents is peak solar energy being converted to chemical energy. So all of our dietary energy comes from the sun and then plants store this solar energy as the high energy carbon carbon bonds in carbohydrates and fats. And at the peak of the summer and the autumn, when you get all of this plant carbohydrate energy and all of this animal fat energy from fatter animals together, you, you know instinctively that you need to just eat as much energy as you can because winter time's coming. Mm -hmm. And so now, you know, of course, winter never comes. It's just summer 24-7, 365, and we just eat these high-carb, high-fat, high-energy density foods all the time. And we have, you know, animal studies, all of your uh, cafeteria diet studies in omnivore mammals like rodents, you feed them this high energy density, high carb, high fat food together, and they automatically just start overeating by 30 or 40 percent of calories. And I think that this is just supposed to make you overeat because you're like, oh, look at all this dietary energy. I've got to eat everything I can because it's going away soon. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I honestly feel that every single successful diet on earth has just one thing in common, 
and that is they avoid the combination of high energy density carbs and fats together. If you look at every diet, like, you know, you've got the high carb, low fat, you know, Dr. McDougall starch solution on one end of the spectrum, and then you've got the ultra low carb, high fat uh, keto on the other end. And really the only thing they have in common is that they're both demonizing the carbs and fats together. That seems to drive overeating more than anything else. And that, that seems to be the one common denominator of every single successful diet pattern on the planet. And uh, so I'm really paying a lot of attention to that in this book. You know, I really want people to be hyper aware of what these foods do to them. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. So to say that I think that there is also like this, there's both like a psychological and a physiological aspect to uh, why people tend to overeat carbs and fats. So uh, like the sugar and the glucose uh, th- th- that it does, you know, stimulate dopamine to a certain extent, which is like the reward mechanism. And uh, the fat is also like a very calori- calor- calorically dense source of energy that you're uh, like just subconsciously wanting to eat because of like, you know, you know in nature, there's not a lot of color calories just laying around. So if you get this dopamine rush that tells you to, this is good, uh, and you're getting the high amounts of energy, then you're just, your brain is literally telling you that, <laughs> keep on doing it, etc. But uh, physiologically, I think that, you know, the, all of the health, negative health outcomes are also coming from the combination of fats and carbs. So, uh, you know, if you eat carbs, and if you raise your insulin with fats, then your body is more predisposed to store those calories as fat because of the high insulin and uh, likewise your body is just also elevates you know triglycerides and uh, that's just causes like metabolic syndrome eventually so to say so there's it's, it's also bad for the fat loss but at the same time it's also bad for your general health to be eating like a bunch of uh, fats and carbs together yeah yeah no i, I totally agree absolutely mm. uh, and but at the same time i fear like uh, what I especially see in like the, and I think that you would have also seen that, you know, the, uh, in, even like in the quote unquote healthy, low carb keto space, or even any other dietary space, there's still like the, you know, invasion of these processed foods that uh, are very hyperphagic and they do, although they're, you know, made with clean ingredients, there's still something that people tend to overeat because they're like, you know, tasty and uh, they're also like pretty you know, hedonic, they cause this hedonic uh, sensation. So what do you think about, you know, keto cookies or (laughs) keto nut bars? Oh, yeah, I have, uh, you know, I want to love these things, but I just have a problem with them because, well, a couple of reasons. First of all, most of them are no higher in protein percentage than the standard American diet. If you really look at your keto snacks and your keto bars and your keto products and you calculate the protein to energy ratio, they're pretty much all going to be right down at the standard American diet mm-hmm. sort of level. So you're, you're not going to get the protein satiety that you might from real food. And then secondly, like you said, they usually involve some sort of high energy density processed refined fat. And if there's any sweet taste uh, along with fat, you're probably going to eat more of it than you should. And you're just going to run into this sort of fat balance problem where you're eating more fat grams than you're expending. And, uh, and once again, I think the solution is something with a higher protein percentage. And I'm in this weird space where I, I'm, I'm, you know, demonizing processed food on one hand, but on the other hand, that's kind of not the problem because if you're eating a processed food, with an insanely high protein percentage, you're just not going to get into any trouble with that. Like if you're eating plain low fat Greek yogurt, you, you cannot overeat that or, or whey protein or some other food that might be quote unquote processed, but has a super high protein percentage. So it, it, it does seem to be processed energy calories. That's the problem, not protein calories. Right, right. That's that's true. So if if the processed food were to be lower in calories and higher in protein, then it would be uh, you know pretty okay in a sense because uh, at the end of the day, 
what matters is like how many calories are you going to be ending or how many calories you're going to be putting into your mouth. Right, right. Yeah, I, I agree. Right. Um, what I wanted to talk about more was um, the fruit and fructose, so to say. Uh, you mentioned that carbs are fine, but uh, what do you think about fruit? So, uh, first of all, I love low sugar fruit. And I, in the book, I encourage everyone to just eat the hell out of low sugar fruit. And what's a low sugar fruit? Well, that's, you know, cucumbers and tomatoes and peppers. And these foods have a very high nutrient density, a very low energy density. They're perfectly healthy. I do think that humans have been eating fruit for millions of years. I do think it's likely we descended from frugivores and there is basically no problem with these fruits. I, I think that even in your higher sugar fruit, the energy density is so low that they're not terribly problematic. I mean, you'd have to eat, you know, 10 apples to get the same uh, energy load that you'd get from a candy bar. And just nobody can eat that much fiber and water. And because the weight of the food is so high and the energy, actual energy is so low, I think fruit is an idyllic way to get your carbohydrates in if you're going to do some carb loading in the evenings. But uh, what I don't want is for everyone to think that, you know, fruit is a free food and fruit is magical because we have so many uh, fruits that have been cultivated for maximum energy yield and the amount of fructose is absolutely ridiculous. And then, God forbid, you juice these fruits and drink that. Um, you're really just going to get a ridiculous amount of pure energy. So, you know, plants store a lot of energy in their fruit and in their tubers and in their nuts and in their seeds. And if you're just intentionally breeding a plant for the very highest energy yield and you're only eating the part of the plant with the super high energy, you might get into trouble. It's like corn, you know, modern corn, modern hybridized corn is this giant energy laden monstrosity that has Mm -hmm. so much energy in it. You can just squeeze it and get corn syrup and corn oil out of it. And the amount of carbon carbon bonds in there is just through the roof. Uh, versus, you know, corn used to be a tiny little, uh, just the seed head of a wild grass, like a wheat stalk today is, you know, the size of your corn from, you know, pre-agriculture, pre-cultivation. And so I think that you got to be mindful of just how much energy we've cultivated the plant to yield in the fruit. And, uh, so I re- for that reason, I really like low sugar fruit. You're just not going to get into any energy problems from low sugar fruit. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So yeah, like although people may think that fruit is like a natural, you know, treat, it still has quite a lot of uh, sugar and uh, fructose in it. So right, it's uh, it's 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 definitely not as bad as uh, like candy bars or uh, chocolate, but. At at the end of the day, it's uh, still something that you can't like overeat uh, unlimited. Yeah, and the other the other thing that I would say is the protein content of fruit is just minuscule. So you you almost have to treat it as a sort of a pure energy food and be very strategic with a high sugar fruit. Yeah, true that. Um, you mentioned fasting, so. Uh, you you yourself do some intermittent fasting, so am I right? Right, I'm I'm a huge fan of intermittent fasting. I love a sixteen eight sort of your lean gains protocol. I think that's probably the sweet spot for the majority of patients that I see, and so that's that's my number one recommendation to most people is to shrink their eating window down to two meals in an eight hour window. I love sixteen uh, eight. That's what I'm doing pretty much every day and uh i just encourage that pattern a lot mm. so how do you uh how do you structure or what what what, what do you consume during the uh, fasting window and what do you eat right well i skip breakfast i i just extend my overnight fast by skipping breakfast and drinking basically black coffee and uh, then i eat lunch and dinner uh lunch for me is about uh 12 or one um, in the afternoon. And then I eat dinner at maybe seven or so at night. And 
Um, my, my setup is basically two large meals. I'm eating about a pound of meat or eggs uh, at these meals and then some sort of green vegetables. So um, lunch for me might just be nothing but a pound of meat. Dinner is usually uh, another pound of meat, some sort of green vegetable, and then occasionally I'll eat some carbohydrate after that, like a potato or a, some sort of fruit or tubers most commonly. It's, uh, I also am intentionally eating the carbohydrate after protein and veggies most of the time with the evening meal um, that seems to give you additional satiety benefits if you time intrameal carbohydrates last. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my basic setup. Two meals, lunch and dinner, a uh, pound of meat or eggs each meal, and uh, then maybe a green vegetable and a carbohydrate source in the evening. And uh, breakfast is black coffee. Okay. Well, that's, that's pretty cool. I would imagine, it, is there like any strategic timing for the carbs, like after a workout or uh, doesn't, doesn't matter in your opinion? I'm really not timing any carbs around my workouts. Mm -hmm. um, I think I do benefit from eating a little bit of carbohydrate uh, um, daily in the evenings, but I'm not doing a, a targeted carbohydrate load like right around a workout. I think that if my schedule allowed it, I would work out right before dinner. And I think that would probably be optimum. Um, I think from a circadian point of view, working out in the late afternoon, early evening is absolutely optimum. And I think that eating your largest meal after that with, with protein and carbohydrate would be optimum. I, it's just that my schedule doesn't always allow that. But yeah, in a perfect world, I would work out um, right before dinner. Okay. Uh, but at the moment, you're working out fasted or what? Yeah, I'm at the moment, I'm working out a fasted um, basically before lunch most of the time. Okay. Right before lunch. Okay, that's good. And uh, what kind of exercise do you do? So I'm a calisthenics fan, and I, and I basically do body weight exercises. You could pretty much sum up my whole workout routine into just push-ups, pull-ups, and squats. That's most of what I'm doing. Uh, if I do... Um, other calisthenics like handstands or um, front levers or um, uh, something along those lines. I'm really, it's really just an extension of basically push-ups and pull-ups. So that's pretty much my, my whole workout. Uh, I'll also usually do some sort of high intensity cardio like jump squats or burpees just for a couple of minutes. And uh, so it's a little blast of, uh, high intensity intervals of cardio, like jump squats or burpees, and then it's basically push-ups, pull-ups, and... Yeah, so that's like a really important aspect of actually the body composition solution and losing weight and staying healthy, like the muscle mass, <laughs> because you can eat all the protein in the, in the world, but still not, you know, uh, see the results if you're not exercising fully, or you may see some, like, definitely you will see some changes and results, improvements, but you know the the final uh, like the final goal is to still exercise and improve your body composition that way because that's like the biggest catalyst to actually like uh, building muscle and uh, losing fat. I absolutely agree, and I tell all of my patients you're never going to get the body composition you want if you're not doing both. You have to focus on your diet and you have to do some sort of resistance exercise. It's really the only way to get optimum metabolic flexibility. That's the only way to get to your, your body composition goals. And a lot of people, I hate to say it, but I think keto draws in a lot of people who are exercise averse and want to try to get there without ever doing any exercise. And they can, they can get improvements, but they just never really cross the finish line. They never really get all the way to where they want to be. Like, like my type 2 diabetics, uh, if they really crank on the diet side of the equation, they can get into remission where they have a normal blood sugar and a normal A1C, but they still can't eat any carbohydrate. Uh, if they overeat at all, their blood sugar shoots up through the roof, and they'll never really get a, a, a full quote-unquote cure of their type 2 diabetes unless they add some skeletal muscle, unless they add some lean mass. 
And once you do that, your ability to dispose of glucose just goes way up. If you have lots of muscle and you're depleting glycogen regularly with high intensity exercise, then you're, you're really, your type 2 diabetes is going to be cured because now you have this metabolic flexibility and this glucose disposal and you can dispose of all these fuels in your diet. And so you really have to be, you have to be pulling both of those levers at the same time, the diet and the exercise yeah. part. And I'm just preaching that to anybody who will listen. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. Like muscle and training are the biggest um, thing or the, one of the best things that make you more insulin sensitive and you can just get away with uh, more, more carbs as well as more calories in general. But, right. Uh, yeah. And, but like muscle mass is also like not only for body composition and, and aesthetics, but also like anti-aging and longevity, so to say, because as you get older, then you're naturally going to lose muscle mass and you're like, you're losing that metabolic, you know, pension fund or bank, bank account. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, we just have all these studies that show that the stronger you are, the longer you're going to live. And so having the highest lean mass at the lowest fat mass should be everybody's goal. And, uh, yeah, I, so many people just work the diet side and really don't put in the time on the on the exercise, and it's just it just kind of makes me sad. So yeah, you absolutely have to do both. You have to do both. In fact, I think people don't understand how powerful exercise really is. You can you can burn a thousand times the energy with maximum high intensity exercise that you can when you're just sitting there fasting. And the reality is that exercise is like fasting sped up. It's fasting and fast forward. You're, you're yeah. really just getting these huge benefits in a microsecond of the time that it takes. You could fast all day or just do a couple minutes of high intensity exercise and end up in the same place. Yeah. And I think a lot of people aren't tapping into that and they're just leaving so much money on the table. Yeah, yeah, you're so right. And uh, yeah, like it's it's so simple, but uh, it's, most people tend to think it's somewhat more complicated than it actually has to be. The, the other thing with exercise is that you can always trade intensity for duration. Uh, most of my patients tell me the reason they're not exercising is because they don't have time. It's all, all about the time. Well, it takes too much time. But if you get the intensity high enough, the amount of time you have to spend is microscopic. I mean, I never work out more than 15 minutes a day, mm -hmm. ever. I frequently, I can do a whole body workout with cardio and resistance in maybe seven minutes. I do, you know, three sets of jump squats to failure and then a triple set of pull-ups and push-ups and I'm done. You've done push, pull, legs, cardio, uh, if you crank the intensity up as high as you can stand, you'll get results in just a few minutes a day. And I think most people don't really realize how little time it takes if you're ultra focused and you get the intensity of effort as high as you can. Yeah, that's so true. Uh, if you, it doesn't matter like how long you train. What matters is the quality of those uh, minutes that you do. And, uh, exactly. Yeah, it's so true. Uh, well, Ted, it's been great uh, talking with you, and uh, like, yeah, like you've you mentioned your book uh, a few times, and that's a, I've uh, had a chance to read it as well, and it's a really good overview of these uh, same principles that we talked about, like how do you maximize or opt optimize the protein to energy ratio of your diet, the exercise and the food choices, etc. So it's definitely like a very good, uh, like a baseline diet for every person who wants to not only improve their body composition, but improve their health as well. So uh, where can people uh, learn more about it and where can they get it? Oh, right. Well, I suggest they go to the website, The PE Diet. That's P-E as in protein energy, thepediet.com. And you can download the book there. It's also on the iBook store and uh, available for Kindle. Nice, nice. And uh, before I ask my last question, where can they learn about you and your work? Oh, right. Well, I have a, I have a website called uh, Burn Fat, Not Sugar. Um, I'm, I have a Facebook group with the same name. I'm also on Twitter, just at Ted Naiman. And uh, Twitter, that's probably uh, the best place to interact with me. Okay, well, that's good. Well, I'm going to leave all the links in the show notes. And uh, my last question is, uh, what's this one piece of advice or a habit that you wish you adopted sooner that improved your body and your mind? 
Oh, wow. I think it's, it was learning to push myself way out of my comfort zone and get used to the discomfort of putting maximum attention in all of my muscles. So I, I don't think I really understood what it took to improve my body composition. You have to put maximum tension in your muscles for the maximum amount of time, and that's extremely uncomfortable. And most people never do that, and they're just not used to that sensation. And I, I wish I could go back in time and kind of teach myself how to do that, um, you know, before, uh, before I learned it. You know, I think that's the, the one thing that's been the most effective for, for my, you know, health and body composition journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point <laughs> that... In order to elicit a change, then you have to give your body like a reason to do it. And right. And subconsciously, or by default, your body doesn't want to change. So there's has to be a reason. Exactly. Yeah, but at the same time, you can also take it too far and uh, like not 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 see any results because you're like overtraining. So it's a fine balance, and the same with with like the that's protein, true. The protein intake. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yeah. So it's been great talking with you, Ted, and I'm uh, looking forward to. Uh, more of your uh, future work about uh, these sort of topics oh same to you thank you so much all right that's it for this episode of the body mind and Formal podcast if you want to support us then i would greatly appreciate it if you could leave us a review on itunes and the other social media platforms you can now order my new book metabolic autophagy that covers a lot of the same topics that we talked in here it's a collection of certain lifestyle habits and practices that prioritize longevity as well as performance to support this podcast, you can also become a Patreon and get exclusive video lectures from my biohacking bootcamp that covers circadian rhythms, intermittent fasting, autophagy, resistance training, biofeedback, and many more. But other than that, my name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.